Hi Diego, Matteo. Howdy YouTube. Welcome to my show today. We are doing something a bit different. We're doing the Kim Dobson Report Parallel University on KAOS 89.3 FM. This is a weekly talk show. Kim hosts um, every week. Hence it's weekly. <laughs> Anyways. We had a little bit of technical difficulties today. This is our second shoot. Where I, you all know me, I'm a shoot by the hip kind of guy. I do <clears throat> try to plan some things out, but yes, things go sideways on you. That's how it works. Life isn't perfect, but we're okay with that. So we missed a few minutes at the beginning of the show. His Welcome guests are putting this show on YouTube because he goes in and he gets activists in our time that are now doing things and puts a spotlight on them. So by me recording his show, I can record in history on YouTube the things that are really going on that you'll never see in mainstream media. And uh, keep the comments nice, polite, questions are welcome. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoy the show. This is KAOS 89.3 FM, Olympia Community Radio. This is also Parallel University. And I'm your host, Kim Dobson. Yeah. I think um, last uh, summer uh, in fall, Marco Rossi ran for mayor of Olympia. And one of the things that he was saying um, often uh, throughout the debates was, um, we have a civilian review over doctors, over teachers. Why don't we have it over the cops? Um, one of the things I think, though, I'd like to things with the prosecuting attorney here in Washington State is actually um, it's code 9.16.040, I believe, is the correct uh, um, Washington Revised Code, uh, which is the laws of the state. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if that's the exact quote, but basically part of it is that how do you prosecute an officer and there's this clause in there saying that um, you have to prove that they were acting without malice mm -hmm. and that clause actually mm -hmm. uh, makes it impossible in Washington State for us to, to prosecute an officer which is one of the reasons why John Thunheim uh, would make the decision to not prosecute Ryan Donald in this. Uh, but it's also along the lines of like you were talking about uh, civilian oversight and that's one thing that um, activists in Olympia, especially Cop Watch, um, but also uh, a lot of us around Black Lives Matter have been pushing for a civilian review board. But one of the biggest problems in this case, as you were saying, was uh, officers and how they're supposed to be unbiased. And the thing is, they all serve each other. Um, and they all have the same biases, and they all have the same buy-ins into the system. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of folks, they say they're workers, uh, they are people just like us. And the thing is, actually, they're serving the state. Mm -hmm. And so it's in the state service, it's in their service, to deny anything happens. And we actually see here in Olympia a lot of times that, um, that officers actually don't file reports at all. Um, when they have police brutality. And there's several cases of that now that we're actually uh, pushing forward, especially around Ryan Donald. He has several incidents now uh, of police brutality, and only a few of them he filed reports on. And uh, we can see, you know, that this is uh, something that not just the Olympia Police Department, but also um, throughout Washington State, throughout uh, Thurston County, throughout America, you know, we are part of this whole system. Uh, just because we are a supposed liberal state doesn't mean that we're any less racist, doesn't mean that our police are any better. Actually, uh, our police can get away with a lot more because they say, well, I didn't do it with racist intentions. Mm -hmm. um, and they have that malice clause. Uh, to actually basically give themselves uh, the ability to wash their hands of racist blood. Yeah, it's interesting in this country. There's another juxtaposition in consumer protection laws. It's off the topic, but it's kind of similar. In, in Europe, uh, if you offer a new drug or, or product into the marketplace, you have to prove that your product will do no harm to the general public. Mm -hmm. In this country, we do it the complete opposite way. We have the FDA give it preliminary approval with minor testing and then it goes out on the market and it takes a class action lawsuit 
to remove a product from the market. In other words, the burden of proof is on the person who's harmed to prove that their harm was enough to cause the product to be taken off the market. So, and the juxtaposition of that in police work in a community is almost the same. Yeah. They're, they're innocent until the community proves them guilty. Mm. Right. And so how can you have uh, community oversight without a community uh, uh, oversight committee that consists of civilians who come from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I think um, last uh, summer uh, in fall, Marco Rossi ran for mayor of Olympia. And one of the things that he was saying um, often uh, uh, throughout the debates was um, we have a civilian review over doctors over teachers. Why don't we have it over the cops? Um, one of the things I think, though, I'd like to ask Crystal if this is okay with it, Kim, sure. is, um, you know, I want to hear about Andre and Bryson. Um, maybe not about their court case, but not a lot of people know who they are personally. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of people thinking that they're stepbrothers when they're actually um, biological brothers. And um, <laughs> they're really tight together they're uh like uh twins i would say you know they're they're doing good but they're in a lot of pain still um bryson is still dealing with a lot of pain having the bullet in his back um i re um, read something that you had posted on facebook saying that the boys were my sons rather were shot in the torso um andre was shot in the torso bryson was shot in the back right yeah, I think there was a disagreement with, uh, um, it wasn't Bryson uh, airlifted to Harborview? Yes, he was. Yeah. After after being at um, St. Peter's Hospital, they airlifted him. Uh, it's my understanding, the first news report that came out of Harborview was the attending surgeon said that he had been shot in the back. Yes, that's when we found out when we were up at Harborview. I didn't know that he was shot in the back when we first went to the hospital to see him at St. Peter's. I didn't find out until maybe a day or two later that he was shot in the back. And not once, but multiple times. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, and, you know, in other cases around the country, it's it's been... Uh, uh, to try try not to go into your case too much right. but the comparisons are all over the news because people have cell phones now they have cell phone videos yeah. so literally there's hundreds of citizens oversight committees operating in the streets which i think is a good thing yes yeah because we if we don't have anybody watching what's going on with law enforcement. We're not doing our part as citizens to create a better society, one that's more fair and has, uh, has compassion right. for everyone and gives everyone the benefit of the doubt yes. uh, when there's a potential uh, infraction of the law being committed. And uh, certainly officers have a lot of tools to use uh, they're all carrying nightsticks. They're all carrying uh, industrial grade pepper spray, mm -hmm. like bear spray. Yes. I mean, these th this, that can shoot 25 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of the, that actually a lot of times also has been le lethal. Um, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about um, when we go into city council meetings, uh, and we do that almost every week, um, like asking for demanding uh, a civilian review board, but also for de-escalation trainings, because that's one of the problems that we see is this cycle of violence um, that happens, especially in Olympia, uh, especially considering folks who are living on the street is these people are already criminalized. These people are already um, in poverty, and then they have violence enacted on them by an officer who's criminalizing them just for trying to live um, and trying to make it by. And then they have, you know, a court case now. They have more frustrations. They have been exhausted by, you know, what's happening here in the city. And wouldn't you be angry? I would. 
Yeah, I, I have been. I've been in that situation. I know what it's like to have the cycle of violence and to get more and more angry when people are pushing me around. Mm -hmm. And so you push back because that's your livelihood. You, that's your life. You have to live. And, you know, a lot of these times the cops are super scary when they come up on you and they're pushing you around. Of course, you're going to push back. And uh, we see in downtown Olympia, they're calling for more police to deal with this problem. And in reality, more police is just going to contribute more violence mm -hmm. and that people are going to be pushing back to that violence as, you know, as th that happens. When it, we have to really take a look and see police may not be the best choice to really make our community safer. It might be more services. It absolutely is more services. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of folks who are houseless. We need to house them. We have a lot of folks who are hungry. We need to give them food. We have a lot of folks who are chemical dependent. We need to give them a, a chance to be able to, to get off of that. Um, we have a lot of folks that, who are dealing um, with mental health, uh, uh, behavioral problems. They need to have uh, more services to be able to, to, to deal with that. And um, more police and more violence isn't going to make our city safer. It's not going to make it safer at all. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's scary going, you know, downtown sometimes because this officer is still on the streets. It's like what if we run into them, run into him and you know, he fears for his life again. You know, it's it's kind of scary because it's like we're we're um a prisoner in our own home. Yeah. Like we have to watch where we're going now. You know, this this situation has changed my life, changed my son's lives drastically. You know, Bryson, he was a dancer and he can't dance anymore. Um, Andre, he's a father of two. He has twin girls and, you know, it's hard and we sh we're struggling financially, emotionally. You know, we're all depressed now and then, you know, we come out of it. But it's it's been really hard. Yeah, that does sound like a very difficult situation. Yeah. Um, it's hard to know that Ryan Donald is on the street as an officer right now and that he's still harming folks. Um, we've gotten, as Cobb yeah. Watch, we've definitely gotten folks who have said oh, yeah. uh, I'm that... I'm afraid for the community because yeah. he's a danger to the community. You know, what, what if he snaps on a child or something he like, snapped on other people and it's it's crazy that they that he's still carrying a gun and walking the streets yeah uh, that does sound scary and you know i i guess i i'm being a white person i kind of have some privilege but i'm not i'm not afraid of him but i'm a man right. and i'm white and i I've been pulled over, and uh, and they asked for my license and my registration, my insurance card, and asked me what I'm doing. And wow, I'm downtown. Mm -hmm. I'm <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. And I know that a lot of people in the community get worse treatment. Yeah. yeah. But I I don't I don't understand why we need six police cars cruising around right. at night. I can I can count that many cars downtown mm -hmm. on a, any given night just doing the beat right around uh 4th and State and the, down Legion and then up Capitol. Right. They they've got a beat they go around and I don't understand why it takes that many cars to do a beat that could be covered by uh maybe one officer and a and a community a community represent a representative who's trained in uh, uh, dealing with uh, people's problems in the streets. You know, somebody mm -hmm. who's a community the activist. The reason why there is that many cops, and I can tell you this because I, I go to city council and because um, I also have been listening uh, into the politics uh, of, of what's going on, is our, our business leaders are calling for more cops. They want our streets to look pretty. That's the reason why, like, we push around, that not we, but why the cops are pushing around so many folks who are homeless um, and people of color and people who um, have chemical dependency or are disabled. Um, it's because uh, our streets aren't pretty enough for our tourists and for our, our rich people to come and shop downtown. And it's actually been stated exactly like that in city council comment periods, as well as outside in um, committees, uh, especially the Better Business Bureau. I think that's that's um, 
known that I'm referencing, but I've, you know, I'm, I, I go to all this and I hear it and it's uh, kind of disgusting to hear our city council members nod their heads saying, yes, we want a more pretty downtown we want, and we want a safer downtown um, and then decide, well, that means more cops. And that's what business you know, owners are calling for, more cops. And that makes the town safe, but for who? And that's for people who have money to spend downtown but not Mm -hmm. for the people who live downtown and not for the people who go downtown to work. Um, I've definitely known friends who work in kitchens and have been pulled over while they're leaving the kitchen to go home from work um, for nothing because they're late. It's it's late at night and because they're brown and um, they're downtown. Yeah, that's a really sad state of policing. We um, never had this problem with brown and white before. I'm from New England, <laughs> so it's it's like kind of different up here. Like to even witness this, that what's going on here, it's like wow, this is really crazy. Like I've never had to go through this before. My children are mixed race. No one knows that. Now they do. <laughs> yeah, I. I grew up in this town from 1950, uh, about 1957, 58. So I've watched Olympia change a lot in those years. That's um, so. Yeah, Olympia has mainly been um, uh, a white town. I well, mean, that's white that's since colonization. Since colonization, <laughs> and then the Native Americans got pushed into the reservation. So yeah. that's that's how it has been here. Yeah, I think and there's actually a history that a lot of people don't know that um, Olympia, like downtown, used to be actually a Chinatown. And uh, there actually used to be a lot more people of color here. Um, but between the 20s and the 50s, it got pushed out a lot um, through a, a v- variety of housing and business initiatives. Y- yeah, I there was used to be a place called Little Hollywood, it was on the water built on uh, piers and rafts right where Capitol Lake is. Mm-hmm. And that was the poor side of town. And they lived, uh, you know, they, live on, they lived on wharves basically with houses built on them and float houses and things. So, and that was all torn out after the Depression for beautification of downtown. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we got, we've got a lot of people on the council who want to beautify downtown. That means like knocking down the old historical buildings and putting up, you know, market rate housing that only rich people can afford. And exactly. I just see this gentrification happening, like what happened in downtown Seattle and mm-hmm. around Pike Place, you know, they pushed out all the low income people and made it unaffordable to live there. Yeah, Kim, I'm wondering how much time we have. Well, left. we can, we can go um, a few more minutes and then I've got, um, I've got David David Alport and uh, another guest, uh, another David from Kenya coming in. <laughs> uh, so they're they're going to be squared. yeah, David squared, and uh, so I do have to make room for them. But I want to come back to this, and maybe we can have an ongoing panel here, maybe next week too. Yeah. And um, yeah, I want to continue this. I would have made this a whole hour, uh, but I did have this request from. David Albert for this man visiting from Kenya who yeah. didn't Thank you hear for having us here. Yeah, yeah no problem. Absolutely. So um, and I, I really appreciate getting on here, especially so that uh, you know there's community events that are happening. Um, oh yeah, please talk weekend. about that. Yeah. Um, so on May 21st, 2016, it's going to be a year since Andre and Bryson were shot. Um, it, we're going to have a march and a rally um, at Woodruff Park, uh, starting there right next to Garfield Elementary at 4 p.m. Um, we're actually having uh, family members from around the state who have dealt also with uh, police deaths, other um, loved ones. Um, we know that uh, on Andre Taylor, um, the brother of Shay Taylor, will be there to speak. Um, Folks uh, uh, Puyallup tribe. Yeah, from the Puyallup tribe are going to be there. Uh, they're going to be singing um, uh, a prayer song for Andre and Bryson and also talking about Jackie Sailors, um, who was murdered in January. Um, and 
there's a lot of folks I actually was speaking to uh, speaking to Montano um, Northwind uh, this morning and praying together talking about you know how do you speak about loved ones who you've lost and um, and just holding space for each other and you know just realizing that there's going to be a lot of people coming together because yes. the it's thing gonna, is it's going to be a wonderful wonderful thing to embrace these people yeah and support them also and also have supporting the us. people power yes coming together asking for justice demanding yeah. justice if we stand together we can get things done mm -hmm. definitely yeah oh. yeah and then um what's uh, do you know the website for the gofundme i don't have it on me yeah yeah Google GoFundMe for Andre and Bryson will come up. Um, but if you go to uh, Olympia Act on Facebook, you can find uh, um, all this information. And then there's also Cop Watch Shifts Thursday and Saturday um, from 5 to 9 p.m. We meet at the well. Uh, if people would like to get involved, um, those are ways that you can. Uh, but definitely Oli Act is uh, the best way on Facebook to really keep updated on everything. Yes. Great. Just. And the Justice for Andre and Bryson page, also on Facebook. All right. Those are all great things to share and uh, keep on sharing. We need to talk about this. This is not, uh, we can't have this silence going on in the community just because there's a case pending. We can talk about everything around it. <laughs> yes. We don't need to keep quiet. We need to make noise. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I... I want to be at this thing Saturday, but I am a legislative uh, delegate for Bernie Sanders. And We've so had I a bunch can. of people actually say, yeah. we got to go do that. <laughs> yeah, so I got to be up at the state capitol all day Saturday. So unfortunately, but somebody's got to be out there batting for Bernie. Yeah. Well, after the Bernie event, y'all should come out. Yeah. I think we're going to be going for a while. We no have good. a bunch of stuff planned and a lot of people who are who are ready to, to go hard um, and demand justice for Andre and Bryson. Yes. So when everybody's done, even if you can't be there exactly at four, we're going to update on the Facebook page of where we're at in the march and what's happening, and um, people should join when they, when they can. All right. Hey, I want to thank you, uh, Crystal Chaplin and Carl Gonzalez. Thank and, you, uh, Kim. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll see you next week. All right. And, uh, this is also <laughs> you. Take University. care. Thanks. I'm your host, Bye. Kim Dobson. And uh, up next, um, we've got a little disclaimer uh, for the college. Um, the preceding and following comments are not necessarily the opinions of the staff, management, or underwriters of KAOS or the Evergreen State College. They are the opinions of the guests and the hosts. And that being said, it's time to hear from Safe Place. And then we have uh, our next guest coming in. Uh, we have uh, David uh, Zarambika, from, uh, originally from the United States, but uh, now lives in Western Kenya and has a school started. He works with the Quakers, the Friends community. And I think there's uh, David Alpert, or Dennis Mills is coming in with him from the Quaker community. So stay tuned for that. Now a message from uh, with joining us today from uh, Western Kenya, uh, David Zeramka. That's correct. Um, and you have been the coordinator for the African Great Lakes, Lakes Initiative for the Friends Peace Teams. And you live in a place called Lumakanda in Western Kenya. And you have decades of experience in Africa. And tell us a little bit about uh, what your life's work is there in, in Kenya. I know you've done a lot of things. Uh, I, I've been reading your bio. Very interesting. Yeah, well, I'm a Quaker, and there are lots of Quakers in Eastern Africa, in Kenya, in Rwanda, Burundi, some in Uganda and Congo also. And uh, the Quakers are most known for their peacemaking work, have been since they began in the 18, uh, 1660s. And uh, there's been a lot of conflicts in those countries. The genocide in Rwanda in 1994, civil war in Burundi from 1993 to 
2005, and it's beginning to disintegrate again. Eastern Congo has been in, in conflict since uh, 1996 to, to the date. In Kenya, they've had post-election violence at least three times. And, of course, in Uganda, in northern Uganda, the Lord's Resistance Army has been devastating the countryside in, since 1986, I guess. So our work is to uh, deal with reconciliation, trauma healing, and uh, conflict resolution uh, in those parts, in those areas that have had all these kinds of problems. Yeah, I've had uh, David Albert on the program many times, and he's been talking about the work the Friends have been doing with the Friendly Water for the World in Central Africa, Central African Republic, and uh, in that in that zone. And it, we've he's brought in some guests from Africa as well. Uh, people, uh, this uh, Reverend Prosper. He's been in. Uh, I don't know if you know who he is. Yeah, I had dinner with him a couple nights ago. Oh, oh, is he in town too? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great guy. Um, yeah, and the work that they're doing there, I I know more about that than than I know about the work in Kenya that the Quakers are doing. But it's it's all good, and certainly those those people that live there uh, have gone through a lot of suffering, and my heart goes out to them. It just uh, is really sad what, uh, we uh, weapons and and fighting over uh, multinationals pitting gr small groups against each other to mine out those rare min minerals for computers and cell phones uh, uh, traded on the international market has done to the people of of uh, Africa, and that's not the only conflict, obviously, but that's one of the big ones in the Central that's, African that's Republic. That's the conflict in the Eastern Congo. Yeah, Eastern and, Congo. Uh, I heard it once being described as cowboy entrepreneurs who uh, exploit the local people and get them in semi-slavery kinds of conditions to to mine those minerals and then ex export them. And of course, the multinationals who are the ones that buy them uh, get a much cheaper price uh, than they would if there was environmental protections and uh, regular businesses and. Uh, it, it, those kinds of things. So um, that's what um, pays for the fighting, let us say. Yes, the arms dealers, the military-industrial complex, they, uh, they find a way to profit regardless of the actual declared state of war or undeclared states of wars. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm right with you, both, uh, both of you guys. I'm... I want to say I totally support your efforts to make peace, and I'm there with you. I'm a steering committee of the Fellowship of Re Reconciliation, so we work here in Olympia on a few things like that, but we don't have the same sorts of conflicts. We just have different ones. Oh, that's correct. <laughs> um, well, tell us a little bit about your work. I'm, I'm most interested to hear um, about what's going on in... Uh, Kenya and uh, and the kinds of things that you're problems that you're helping to uh, address. Well, our main program is called uh, Healing and Rebuilding Our Communities, HROC, which we pronounce as HEROC. And what we do is we take uh, 10 survivors, say, of the genocide in Rwanda and 10 perpetrators of the genocide and give them a three day experiential workshop. Um, with the intent of restoring the normal kinds of relations that they had, say, before the genocide. And uh, it's very, very intense. Uh, we take t the people from the local, a local community so they know, all know each other, but when they first come in the room, the Hutu are on one side, that's the perpetrators, and the Tutsi, who are the victims, are on the other side of the room. They don't greet each other, they don't look at each other, and uh, in three days, one has to break down that uh, animosity and and make the people to be friendly with each other again and, and have normal kinds of relationships. Yeah, it sounds like a difficult uh, charge considering uh, um, the elements of post-traumatic uh, trauma disorders that come up when there is genocide. Uh, people 
you know, I'm sure they all have nightmares about what has happened to them or their families and friends. And how, how do you get through that? Because that's kind of a permanent thing in the subconscious. And on the surface, that's, I mean, if they're, they're greeting each other again, but then there's much work to do after that. Isn't right. There? Uh, one point is that the perpetrators are also traumatized by what they've done. Oh, I'm sure. That's I didn't leave them out. <laughs> right. So uh, bringing them together in the same seminar uh, allows both sides to hear the others, uh, what happened to them and how they responded to the difficulties and why perhaps they've done different things. And uh, most people who are traumatized um, bury their trauma inside them and kind of try to uh, ignore it or... But that's why people, you know, wake up at the night screaming uh, or have bad dreams, things like that, is because, of course, they, they're repressed whatever traumas that they've had. So usually in our workshops, it's the first time that people have ever had a chance to talk about their uh, what they went through and how it affected them. And uh, so, 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 so there, we, we use uh, uh, Judith Herman's trauma and recovery as the basis, the stages of recovery from trauma. And uh, sort of the first stage is just to to uh, acknowledge uh, the trauma and bring it out. And then uh, the next stage is to grieve over what you've lost, how to deal with the anger. And for us in, in Africa, it's also how do you rebuild the community because the community has been uh, traumatized just as individuals have been. So you want to restore their confidence, not only in each other, but in their their society and their community. I understand um, a little bit about uh, this work. I've heard of this work before in Rwanda. Um, and I consider it to be a, a very powerful way, way of dealing with conflict. It's I mean, we do have conflict resolution uh, groups here in Olympia that work when it's a problem that the courts can't solve. I mean, the, the courts can't solve trauma. They, they oftentimes they make it worse. That's correct. So, uh, punishing the victim and the perpetrator doesn't solve ultimately solve any kind of trauma. So, uh, and that's just. That's so you travel out of Kenya into uh, into uh, Rwanda to do this work, or is this is are these Tutsi and Hutu peop, uh, refugees within Kenya, the uh, people no, that escaped the? Violence? No, I I travel to those countries, but uh, for it to work well, I don't really do the workshops myself. So I'm the organizer who puts it together, gets the funding, um, has developed the program through the stages that it took us about five years to develop the program adequately and so we have local facilitators but we make sure that in every workshop that we have at least one male we have three facilitators one must be a male one must be a female one must be a Hutu one must be a Tutsi and when we do we do them in Kenya also uh, th with different where it's tr uh, tribal conflicts due, due to elections or other mm -hmm. issues and there again we make sure that our um, facilitators are diverse because we want to model what we what results we want and that's that's very effective Wow that's very powerful work um, I can't say enough how much I uh, how much that moves me that's just a really wonderful I well, thank you got to hand it to you and all of your uh, Quaker brethren and and sister folk who uh, are helping you out there. Um, so, and I understand from reading your bio uh, that you have a school also as well. You have a school with 450 students. Well, uh, no longer. I started that, uh, I've been in, uh, well, I went first in 1964 to teach uh, Rwandan refugees from the time of independence who had to flee Rwanda. And, uh, so I've been in Africa a long time, although sometimes I've lived in the United States. And uh, in 1968, 69, I started a, a secondary school in Kenya at the time, right after independence, when um, 
people were wanting to have more education because the British colonials had had little little educational opportunities, particularly at the secondary school level, and particularly for for females. So while our the school I started was both male and female, over time uh, it became a female school, all, all girls school, and right now it's called the Mool Hills Secondary School. And I was just there about a year ago or so to see how they're doing and they're doing quite well and continuing. And the buildings I built in the 1968, 69, all of them are s still being used, so that's sort of gratifying. Wow. <laughs> yeah, great work. Uh, so it, it's, it, is it still somewhat, um, for the people that live in the bush, is it, is it common for people to travel long distances to go to school? Well, when we first started, like I said, there wasn't very many opportunities for, for girls. And when we started, you have to take exams. It's a British system, examination system. When they, even the first time we took exams, that we got very high results for the girls, much better than the boys. Um, so it became a rep, got a reputation of uh, being good for, for girls. So we got many more good girl, female students. Um, and the government noticed this. So uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the government took over the school, and then they made it uh, what they call a provincial school, which means it brought students from all over eastern. It was in eastern uh, Kenya, east of Nairobi. So it took uh, students from all over that province. They would be the ones with the highest scores. So that's one of the reasons it's continued to do well. Amazing. Uh so you got you finally, you, yeah. It seems like good things are started by, <laughs> by NGOs, and then when the government finally notices, <laughs> uh, some years later that you're doing good work, then they say, "Oh well, <laughs> we right. want to be involved with that too." <laughs> I guess that's a good thing, but you would, you almost want the the startup money from the, from the ground up and get the cooperation of the government. You would think. Uh, uh, but sometimes they're not capable of doing it or not able to because of budgetary constraints. Right. Well, w when I started, it was, it was called a Harambe School, which means we had to pay, had to uh, have a fairly high tuition. And of course, when the government takes it over, they start paying for the teachers and the textbooks and things like that. So it's much more, let us say, economical. It's affordable, to affordable yeah. for low income families. Right. And, yeah. And that's also a good thing. Um, so what, what other kinds of work do you do there? I mean, I know that's, it sounds like you already do a lot. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm married to a Kenyan, uh, Gladys, whom you met outside. And, uh, she's a Quaker actually from a Kenyan Quaker from by background. And that's, we met in Bethesda meeting in outside of Washington, DC. And, uh, so, uh, um, she has a very large family and, uh, she takes care of them as I'm sort of doing my peace work. So we have a lot of uh, two grandchildren and a grandniece, grandnephew living with us, and we send another one to, to college, another one to high school. And, of course, there's lots of issues in the community, and so we're very involved in uh, both the community activities and the local Quaker church activities and uh, and you're are you're here as a a, a visiting uh, scholar with the Olympia Friends uh, group. Yeah, we, we have a uh, talk about your event. Okay, I bet you've got one. Yeah, I've got them <laughs> written down here. Um, we Friends Peace Teams is the overall organization, and we have programs also in Central America and Colombia, and also in Nepal and Indonesia. And so once a year, we have what we call a face-to-face -face meeting. And this year it's here at Olympia meeting. And so we're starting to this afternoon and, and all day tomorrow. And then on Saturday we have what we call uh, Peace Quest 2016, which is a peace day at Olympia uh, Friends meeting. And uh, it ha we'll have a keynote speaker and uh, 10 workshops and uh, then uh, a panel discussion. And uh, it's at the Friends Meeting House, which is 3201 Boston Harbor Road in Northeast. And then on Sunday, I'm going to be speaking briefly for f at a Friendly Waters for the World meeting, uh, which will be at uh, 4709 82nd Avenue Southeast. Um, 
but you need to call 360-918-3642 to let people know if you're coming to that one. But the one at uh, the uh, Olympia meeting on Saturday, Peace Quest, uh, you can just come on, show up at the door, and we'll be more than happy to have you come. Uh, those sound like wonderful events, and I wish I could be there. I'm going to apologize again. Yeah, I heard you were going to be doing a <laughs> Bernie Sanders right. thing. Yeah, we're going to we're going to do the old fashioned caucus right uh, here in this state. We almost lost it. We almost voted it away to a primary. <laughs> mm-hmm. Didn't quite happen. One vote. Oh right. Okay. Um, but thank you. Um, and let me get your last name correctly. It's I think I because there's a lot of vowels in, or it's a lot of uh, Zer- Zermka? Zeremka, yes. Zeremka. Now, and people think that it's an African name, but it actually it's Polish. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, David. And uh, David is, is the coordinator of the African uh, Great Lakes, in- Lakes Initiative, Friends Peace Teams. Currently lives in Lukanda, Lumakanda, Western Kenya. So uh, keep up the good work, and ah, I love what you're doing. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, no problem. Yeah, anytime David says he has a guest, I'm I'm willing. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're always good. <laughs> good. Hey, you take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Uh, and this has also been Parallel University, and I'm your host, Kim Dobson. The preceding uh, opinions are not necessarily the opinions of the staff management or underwriters of KAOS or the Evergreen State College. They are the opinions of the guests and the host. And now it's time for... Connect the dots. <laughs>